Welcome to Banded the Encore. Good evening. I'm your host, Ashley Live. We have an incredible show lined up this evening. Steve Diamond, the members of Starland, and Wendy Starland will be joining me. Starlin's love song, Hand Me Down Heart, just one song of the night. But my very first guest this evening is the incredible Steve Diamond, mentor for Monochromatics. Steve is an accomplished songwriter earning four Grammy nominations, an Emmy Award, and the title of Songwriter of the Year by American Songwriter Magazine. His songs have been recorded by the Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, Faith Hill, and countless others. His hit song, I Can Love You Like That, received Song of the Year, and his work on According to You has gained massive popularity with over 105 million views on TikTok. Prior to his breakthrough success, Steve honed his skills as a studio and touring guitar player. Welcome, Steve. How are you this evening? I'm great. It's good to see you, Ashley. Good to see you as well, Steve. So last week, Monochromatics won Song of the Night with their track, Mid of May. Congrats. Can you just take us through the evolution of this song? Of course. That was really an exciting night. Uh, When I work with an artist, I don't try to impose my vision on them. I want to find out what their individual strengths are. And Mm -hmm. fortunately, with this group of people, we have a huge, diverse group. influences from hip hop to Latin to rock to pop. Mm -hmm. So we really uh, wanted to play on everybody's strength. And the the task for the week was to write a banger. Now, a banger can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And I think the normal thought is a real aggressive rockish kind of thing. But we decided to go with a more celebratory, joyful point of view. So um, we came up with a, it's, it's a dance song, but it's an inclusive dance song encouraging everyone to get involved. And mm-hmm. uh, there's a Spanish element in our song. And I had very rudimentary high school Spanish. So unless we wrote about the library, my Spanish was not really helpful at all. But yeah. fortunately, Miahona and Ammon are fluent Spanish speakers. So they provided the Spanish uh, aspect of the song and everybody just contributed. Jojo had a cool bass line going. So we kind of started with the groove and everything evolved from there with everybody putting in their, their influences and pieces and was really happy with how it turned out. I thought that maybe a little touch of reggaeton might be cool. Um, mm-hmm. so probably none of the other bands were likely to do that. So I think we came in with a little bit of a unique angle on the thing. Yeah, I love the unique element of Spanish music and a banger and all the elements of that song together. So what were some of the milestones and creative decisions that helped shape the journey of the song? Well, I'm trying to think of milestones and creative decisions. I think basically to go in a more pop rather than kind of an aggressive rock way and to find, to build it on the groove, as I said, from a bass line and just to make it positive all the way and not not angry, not aggressive. And once we locked into the chorus, um, we just kind of found the threads of melody and we all chipped in lyrically and uh, very happy with how it turned out. We went into the studio and everybody killed it on their instruments, so couldn't be happier yeah. with it. Yeah, it's such a fun song, and I love that you guys were the very first band to win of the show. How fun is that? That was fun. We were just trying to find our footing. Everybody was, and we didn't know yeah. what the, not only what the outcome, but what the whole texture of the show was going to be. So it was really exciting to get that shot in the arm from that first week's winning. Yeah, because you're on a high, and you're like, hey, we already won. Now we're going to win the rest of the weeks. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. I Can Love You Like That and According to You are both incredibly successful songs. What do you believe sets these songs apart and makes them easy to connect with listeners? That's a great question. When you're writing, you sometimes don't know, but sometimes you do. And in with I Can Love You Like That, I think we knew instantly that there was something connecting within us. And if it connects to you as the writer then you're hoping that it connects to the audience. And I think that the theme of that song is, you know, everybody has this dream of what their love is, whether you're male or female or whatever, what, uh, 
what love is going to be like. So this song is about what love can be like. I can love you like that. I can love you like the fairy tales that you grew up hearing. Mm -hmm. So that one uh, came together very naturally. And it, you know, fortunately it found two great homes with all for one being the pop artist that cut it and went to number one with them. And then John mm -hmm. Michael Montgomery did a country version that also went to number one. So the song really did connect. And sometimes the evidence of that is more powerful than actually seeing it on the charts. I get asked to sing that at people's weddings who I don't know from time to time, which is really a very moving thing for yeah. me. And uh, regarding According to You, that was had kind of an interesting concept behind it. I think so many of us get put in a box by people. Oh, he's good at this. She's good at that, but not good at these other things. So According to You starts off, According to You, I'm stupid, I'm useless. You know, I'm getting put down by people. But according mm -hmm. to him, someone else who sees my value, who sees what I can be. And one of the, again, most moving things to me is on TikTok, people have, there's hundreds of thousands of kids doing videos of it. And sometimes it's like someone saying, according to you, I'm stupid, I'm useless. That could be like one person said, that's my birth mother thought that about me, which is so mm -hmm. powerful. But according to him, my new boyfriend, my new husband, seeing what a song means to someone else beyond what when you're a writer you have your concept of what it is but seeing that it's important to someone else for other reasons is one of the most rewarding parts of being a songwriter and it's very powerful to me mm -hmm. i like what you said about i can love you like that right because we've all been in love and we've heard this song many times with both artists covering it. But then you talk about According to You and how TikTok has really revolutionized the music industry and how all these people are now making songs and saying like, yeah, According to You, this is what happened to me and putting their own spin on it in social media. Yeah, that again, that's about the most powerful thing as a songwriter. Uh, you know, seeing it on the charts, of course, is wonderful, but seeing what it means to someone else one person said, according to, you know, uh, on one of the TikTok videos, according to you, I'm all this kind of negative stuff, but according to him, and then they point up to God, I'm beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that got me when someone used, used it in that way. So, uh, and some people have said it's helped them through relationships. So that's kind of when you hear that from people who are not in the music business, it's very powerful and means a lot. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think TikTok is one of those things where they take these songs and it's then it's put into the universe and people have the visual aspect of it and they just put their phone in front of their face and they don't even really think too much of it. It's not anything, you know, there's no script. There's no nothing. It's like, hey, I'm in my car. I'm walking down the street. And this is what I think. Yeah, yeah. And seeing it again means something in someone's life that you don't know across the world. Uh, it's beautiful what music can can bring to people and how it can bring people together. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, it's very cool. Having achieved significant recognition in the industry, how do you stay motivated and continue to innovate with your songwriting? Well, thank you for asking that. For me, it all comes down to the very basics, what I loved at the beginning. I am made my living as a guitar player first mm -hmm. and uh, have played in all kinds of bands, terrible bands, good bands, in pretty much every genre. So literally feeling the guitar in my hands, strumming the strings, uh, makes things happen chemically in my body. Mm -hmm. Same with piano, but I've learned, I've gotten a lot of courage over the years in just putting stuff out and daring to suck, which is a really important thing. I, mm -hmm. I, something moves me, I'll start just singing anything, uh, some syllables come out, eventually a word or two that you want to hang your hat on. So it's not hard for me to find inspiration. I mean, I love music and all kinds of music and also just listening to other people's music uh, always inspires me, but it's such a personal thing. And again, being kind of at one with my instrument guitar, uh, mm -hmm. just picking it up, playing a different chord sets me on in a certain direction. So that's kind of my inspiration. And I, I read a lot. I'm always writing down phrases that come to me. So that's, I'm inspired by kind of word combinations as well. In fact, according to you was a good example. I had that 
phrase in my book for a couple of years, according to you, according to you, and then the flip, but according to him, that came to me like three years later. So yeah, that play on words really uh, is, is something I enjoy a lot. Mm -hmm. I love what you said about the play on words because you wrote according to you down, but you weren't really sure what you were doing with it until it came to you a couple of years later. And you're like, oh, here it is. I got it. That's very good, actually. That's that's true. You sometimes you don't know, and again, phrases. Uh, I'm always driving my wife crazy because we're in the middle of a deep conversation. She says something, and I say, and I kind of tune out. Oh, that's great. And a phrase uh, suggests a melody to, melody to me very often. So that's also a departure point. But you're right. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes I have. It's almost like throwing pick up sticks or chopsticks in the air. I'll, I'll sometimes when I don't have particular inspiration, pick up the guitar, look at all the various phrases I've written down and this chord happens at the moment that I'm looking at this phrase and this word and just kind of, it's kind of beautifully random in that way. Yeah, because you never know when it's gonna come to you. Like it could come to you while you're driving down the street or when you're walking your dog or something like that. And you're just like, oh, it's right here. Yeah, yeah, you do never know. And I always keep a notebook by my bed and a tape recorder, but uh, a lot of stuff comes in that semi-dream state as well. Definitely. So what other music inspires you? Like if you're hanging out on a Saturday, rocking out, what music are you listening to, Steve? Wow, that's a great question. I, I go so far back. I, my father was into folk music. And mm -hmm. I grew up loving folk music and uh, also electrified folk music. There's a whole genre of English bands like called Pentangle and Father mm -hmm. and Gay. And you may not be familiar with these, but it's kind of Celtic in a way. So that's mm -hmm. one aspect of what I listen to. And I always love Motown and I love, I love guitar oriented, melodic pop music. The Beatles were mm -hmm. major to me. Mm -hmm. I think John. John Mayer is amazing, Jesse mm -hmm. Winchester, but love, you know, Coldplay and Michael Jackson. Prince is amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. So I listen to a wide variety. I, I check out the Spotify, you know, lists every every couple of weeks. But mm -hmm. basically, you kind of go back to some of your old favorites. I mean, the Beatles are always a big part of it for me. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's important to listen to a wide range of music because then you can take that inspiration from like the Beatles, but then that specific Motown song spoke to you as well. You know, exactly right. You know, this is kind of going back a few of your questions, but I was very fortunate. My first successful record was with Eric Clapton when I was about 18. It was called I've Got a Rock and Roll Heart. And it was a big worldwide hit. And I... Uh, I was all full of myself. Oh man, I'm this wonderful hit songwriter. And then I signed with a publishing company that didn't really value rock oriented stuff. It was way more R and B and urban. And mm -hmm. that was not my world, but I learned to do that. I got, uh, you know, the MPC 60 drum machine and learned to do bottom in there. So out of crisis and self doubt, I learned to do a lot of different types of music from, from there. And, you know, I've always been into various kinds of rock, but uh, more of the rhythm oriented and, uh, and Latin stuff. I'm not that big in Latin. I don't know tons about it, but I, I love working in it and um, just came through not knowing and just being wide eyed and open and wanting to learn about a different kind of music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very powerful for you to admit and be honest and say like, hey, I think I'm great because I worked with Clapton. And then you're like, oh, but now I have to change my viewpoint and step outside of myself and be like, okay, what is the next goal for me? That's right. It's, it's all about learning and keep on learning. I mean, music, you can't ever learn all about music. It's so beautiful and mathematical and spiritual. It's just kind of a never ending canvas to keep painting on and learning from. Definitely. As a songwriter, what do you consider to be your greatest strength? I think my strength is having had so many different influences and being a musician and having played 
from classical guitar, I studied classical guitar at UCLA and being in Beatles bands and R&B bands. So I think the diversity, but I also feel like loving books and reading and English that my, my loving the language so much is, uh, Mm -hmm. is one of my strengths. And then another one, this goes, I was again, lucky to have grown up in LA to certain degrees. Some people might say that's not lucky, but I live in Nashville (laughs) now, by the way, but also keep a place in LA. Uh, Yeah is I had a publishing deal and a bad record deal when I was very young, like 16. And I was beaten over the head by so many people being critical, but, you know, lovingly critical. That doesn't Mm -hmm. work. This line doesn't pay off. This doesn't make sense. And when you kind of take that all in, you don't get insulted at each criticism. But if you get a preponderance of criticism about a song, not getting to what you thought it was going to be, you learn... Mm -hmm navigate uh, how to get from A to B. And there's no real formulas in songs, but I do feel like even weird songs, you have to have some kind of emotional thread going from the beginning to the end. So I would say one of my strengths is realizing that. And when I'm working with a young songwriter, I can help them navigate. Yeah, that's a cool word or a cool line, but it really doesn't make sense emotionally in the context of this whole song. So I would say one of my strengths is navigating an emotional thread from top to bottom. And then I'm always writing down chorus ideas and thoughts. So coming in with what I think are strong ideas to writing sessions. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful because you want to have that emotion from the beginning of the song to the middle, as well as towards the end. And I love what you said about that and making sure that you're hitting all those, those parts of the song. And that's what ultimately makes it a great one. Right. Right. Very good. Awesome. Well, Steve, that's all the time that we have for this evening, but this was so much fun. I'm so excited to see what you guys have planned for the rest of the show. And thanks for spending your evening with me. Thank you, Ashley. Appreciate it. You did a great job. Made me feel comfortable and um, total pro. Uh, Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Steve. And we will see you soon. Have a good one. Look forward to it. You too. Bye-bye. FairJet, the best way to travel in a safe, environmentally sensitive, state-of-the-art jet aircraft. FairJet is changing the way people in the know travel. It gets you where you want to be, based on your schedule, not the airlines. No hassle. Fly in perfect comfort, convenience, and safety. Next time you need to fly, fly private. Check out Verijet. It's more affordable than you may think. Everybody is talking about Verijet. Welcome back to Banded the Encore. I'm your host, Ashley Live. My next guest is Molly Rose, a drummer from Starlin. So Molly Rose is a 23-year-old drummer hailing from California. She moved to Nashville in September after completing college, all in pursuit of a career in country music. Recognized as country drummer girl across social media platforms, Molly collaborates with brands to promote artists' music and endorse various products further establishing her influence in the industry. Hey, Molly, how are you today? Hello, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Yes, me too. Awesome. Let's hop right into it. So what inspired the creative process behind Hand Me Down Heart? And were there any specific experiences or emotions that influenced the development? Oh, great question. Um, I know when we kind of start talking about what kind of love song we wanted to do i believe Mm -hmm. it was jacqueline that kind of came up with the phrase like hand me down heart and kind of talking about you know how you have a past with a lot of people and you Mm -hmm. come into new relationships with a lot of baggage but um 
someone that you're with and if they truly love you they can kind of like mend your heart so that's what we wanted to kind of go for we wanted to kind of go more on the positive side but it's kind right. of like a happy and sad love song which is really cool the way that it came together yeah. Yeah, I love that because I think love is one of those things where you're happy, you're sad, you're fighting. There's like yeah. all these emotions that come with it. Yeah. And I like what you said about baggage, carrying that into new relationships. I feel like that's something we're all very guilty of. Yeah. No, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Among the feedback given by the judges, which advice resonated with you the most? Mm. I would say I loved how almost every week they kind of talked about how we were like a band and we were like a cohesive unit. Uh, and I remember yeah. one of the judges said the first week that we were like arena ready. And I think that was like the craziest feedback that we got. Cause I haven't, I haven't had the chance to play an arena yet. So mm -hmm. I think hearing that, I think really kind of put like a fire in us that, we could really get to a level like that, even when we had only known each other for like at that point a week. And even week two, we had only known each other for, you know, two weeks. And we were already writing songs that DJ Swivel said were interesting. Like he said that Hand Me Down Heart, that was kind of a, a newer way to say something that's been said before. So that was mm -hmm. really cool. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Love that. And being arena ready is amazing. That's like probably the highest compliment you could receive. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, that was very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And especially because you guys didn't really know each other that well. So how do you feel you guys were able to bond as musicians that didn't really know each other before that? Yeah, I think at first, well, I know I put this, I think I put this in my email to you. Um, at first, I was like not sold on the I was not sold on like the Starlin thing because I was coming into it and I'm like a country person and I, I thought I was going to be put into a country band and I was like ready for that and so when I was putting Starlin at first I was a little shocked and I was like oh mm -hmm. man like we're gonna have to go kind of more like the rock direction um, and we all come from like different backgrounds like me and Jacqueline are very country and then the two Florida boys are very like pop punk and then Will is very like metal rock um, mm -hmm. so I think at first Wendy kind of sat us down and I think she really helped us figure out our sound. And that's kind of how we got like the Demi Lovato, like Paramore sound, which is like awesome. And I think that yeah. we really honed in on that and we found something that we all like and not just, mm -hmm. you know, half the band likes. We found something that we all like could participate in and we just started bonding. Like we would go get coffee together. We went to the mall together to go pick out our outfits. Like we would watch movies together. Like just spending like a lot of quality time together, I think helped mm -hmm. us write music that people liked. Yeah, I agree with that because you need to bond with these people, right? You can't just like go in a room and say like, hey, we're going to write a song together. Like you need yeah. to know who these people are, what they eat for breakfast, yeah. like what their fashion style is, like how they communicate. Do they yeah. communicate? Do they clam up? Mm -hmm. What kind of person are we working with? You yeah. Know? And I mean, we spent two months with each other. So we literally did. I mean, we all genuinely love each other. Like we wanted to hang yeah. out with each other. So that was really cool. Like we actually wanted to hang out. And I love everybody in my band. Um, but I think it was cool that we were able to spend so much time together. And we kind of like knew each other's like quirks and like ticks and how to communicate with each other better through that. It was cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Communication is so important, especially when you don't know the person, right? And you're like, yeah. well, how do you communicate? Like, are you not going to communicate? Are you going to communicate? Are you honest with me? Are you going to tell me what I want to hear? Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Mm -hmm. So what was it like when you were picking out outfits together and you were able to just kind of figure out more about everyone's personality and style? Very fun. I, I love doing that kind of stuff. I I think that because I'm not like a huge songwriter, I'm kind of, I mean, I play the drums, so mm -hmm. I don't have a ton. I didn't come into this having a lot of experience songwriting and like that being my main thing. So in the band, mm -hmm. like, you know, I, you know, Wendy and I wrote, you know, most of the drum parts. Um, and then I, I kind of felt like I was like the band manager a little bit. Like I would be like, okay, this is what we're wearing today. Like we're going to go with, you know, red, like for, uh, hand me down heart. I think we did pink. So we did like pink and black. So like, I kind mm -hmm. of helped, you know, pick out like the outfits. I tried to help with like getting the logo done and, um, like our band staging, I would like make everybody go outside and like, we would set up cones and I would make like everybody like 
be like, okay, this is the guitar. Cause I mean, that stage was in, like insane. So I was kind of like, mm -hmm. we have to figure out how to use all of the stage. Cause it can't just be, you know, four of us back here and Jacqueline's just walking up and down the guitar. So I would like be like, okay guys, we got to like practice our blocking and stuff. So I yeah. don't know, but it was, it was fun. I like doing that kind of stuff. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And definitely using the stage to its advantage, right? Yes. I see. I feel like it's so important when you see the size of the stage to take up the stage and make sure everybody that's watching feels like they're a part of the performance. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when we walked in there for the first time, I, I was like with Jacqueline. I remember we just looked at each other and we were like, oh my God, that's a big stage. I remember we both kind of yeah. like freaked out a little bit. We we're like, wow, that's, that's big. Like that's a, that's a, that's like a rock star stage, you know, that's like a Motley Crue kind of stage. So definitely. Yeah. And they said that you were good enough for an arena. So it was kind of like you were an arena because yeah. the stage was so big. Yeah. Which was very cool. Good practice, I guess. Yeah, definitely. So what do you enjoy most about collaborating with other musicians? Mm, good question. I think before the show, I wouldn't have really known how to answer that because a lot of the stuff I've done is just with artists. Like I get hired to like play with random people. Like that's what I mainly do. Um, mm -hmm. But I think just kind of becoming friends with them and then through that writing songs is like a really cool thing. Cause like, even when I go back and listen to like ready or, or not that song, when I go back and like listen to like hand me down hard and our song from our first week, I'm like, wow, I like, I wrote this with like my friends. Like it's really cool. That, like my friends are playing yeah. guitar on it and like Jacqueline's singing on it and Rob's playing guitar. Like that's really cool. Like that's something that I don't think a lot of people get to experience. Mm hmm. Yeah, and the bond as friends, but then also as a band. And you're like, wait, I love all these people. Yeah. This is so fun for me. Yeah, it's awesome. It's very cool. Love that. Well, that's all the questions I have for you this evening, Molly. But thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited to hear more from Starlin. Yes, me too. On Bandit. Awesome. Woo! Thank you so much. Time is what we make it. A single moment can be unforgettable. This is the power of wearing a Bulova. Make bold moves that reverberate across generations. In 15 years, you drink about 15,000 cups of coffee. So Colgate created Optic White Pro Series Toothpaste with the power to remove 15 years of stains for a Pro Series smile. Colgate Optic White Pro Series. We're back on Banded the Encore. Appreciate you rocking out with us. I'm your host, Ashley Live. My next guest is Sergio Canada, basis for Starland. Sergio is a bass player hailing from Boca Raton, Florida, and is a proud member of the band Audio Crisis. Sergio embraces his role as a bassist with a passion for music, utilizing it as a medium to channel his boundless creativity. He values fellow musicians who share his enthusiasm for exploring new ideas and pushing the boundaries of their craft. Hey, Sergio, how are you this evening? Hey, thank you, Ashley. That was quite an intro. Yes, but Sergio, you deserve it. <laughs> stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> How's your night going? So far, so great. Um, you know, I'm just here with my bandmate, Robert. We're working on some music upstairs. Mm -hmm. And then tonight I have something going on with my niece and graduations and whatnot. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. So I want to talk about one of the most favorite moments in the process of creating or performing Hand Me Down Heart. Talk to me about that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we were tasked to perform a love song or, well, write and create a love song. And I mean, mm -hmm. for me, what, what I really loved about writing with Starland in general was from start to finish it seemed like the song wrote itself and you know mm -hmm. when you get all these musicians that come from you know the, almost like the same walk of life because we listen to the same music and we have like the same feeling towards what's good and what's bad I, I'm I'm very glad that we were all able to get together and make this uh, song which was such a cohesively 
well put together song. I'd say my favorite moments maybe would have to be the lyric, you know, where in the chorus, uh, it, it sums up the whole song. You got me used, you got me broken, you got me worn out from the start. Um, you said you'd fix my broken parts. And then this li this line right here, we were like, what do we put here? I want to hand me, I want to hand you my heart, you hand me your heart. I'm like, huh, what about hand me down heart? And we're all like, yeah, that sounds great. That's amazing. I, I can't remember, you know, we were, we were there. We were like, Jacqueline was singing this, hand me your heart. I'm like, say hand me down heart. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. It was quite a moment. Yeah, and it's got to be so cool because you're with these people that you didn't really know a couple weeks ago. And then you're thrown in this house, you're in this band, and you're supposed to make and record and write and perform these new songs together. We got, we got the best band because we all, when we got together, it's like we all knew what we had to do. You know, like we were very lucky to have uh, Robert, who was a great, um, not just a great musician, creator, but he could record and, you know, he was basically our engineer. So we were able to just r write and record everything right on the spot. And I mean, obviously, the producers love that because uh, we could just give them a cohesive, like, you know, a almost like a finished piece, like a whole demo. But it sounded great, you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, Definitely. We, worked, we worked very hard and we worked very fast, too, which was quite um, I mean, I'm excited to get back in the studio with that band because we've got a lot of uh, passion. That's for sure. Passion, energy, friendships, good vibes. I feel like this show brought you guys all together and you're able to create all these beautiful pieces of music because of yes. it. So can you share some insight into how you guys bonded as a band and what factors you think contributed to your strong working relationship? Well, I'll talk about it, how how I remember it happening when we were all split up. You know, we were all told to stand in the kitchen and they were going to tell us where what band we were going to be in. I'm over here secretly thinking to myself, I'm like, man, I have pink hair, so there's no way they're going to put me in a country band. I'm like they gotta put yeah. me in something cool, cause a guy with pink hair, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cut it or change the color. So it's just got, I can't just stand out like a sore thumb. So yes. once like you know they picked all the bands, we were the last ones standing, and we we're just looking at each other like, well, obviously this is my band, and I'm like, man, we are quite a good looking group of people. <laughs> I thought that we all fit together so perfectly, like, you know, we almost look like we're a family, which. Mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, very well done by the producers to, you know, have all of us, uh, you know, be a band. And the, the, the most interesting part I remember was them saying that Jacqueline had a background in country, Molly had a background in country, me and Robert came from a punk band, and William was like mm -hmm. good old classic rock and roll. But I think yeah. that all of those have... Uh, a route to them that we could all meet in the middle of, which was, I think, what defines Starland. Yeah. Because it's all these diverse people, different personalities, with different musical backgrounds, and you incorporate all that into what Starland really is. Right. All of us had, from every single musical background, it all played a part into what we did in that uh in that short time frame that we all uh were creating so mm -hmm. i mean i I'm, i mean molly molly playing uh the the country drums compared to the pop punk drums or you know the pop type style that we were playing i think that was mm -hmm. the biggest leap but jacqueline she she came from the rock and roll background before she did country so that that worked out perfect for us mm-hmm yeah, because there's country and there's rock and there's pop punk and there's all these other things that really bring in so many cool elements yeah, and to all, the band. it all comes from the blues anyway, so, you know? Yeah, sure does. So how did it feel winning Song of the Night? Oh, man. You know, I felt 
uh, two things. One, I felt a little uh, cheated, but then at the second time, you know, the second the second thing I felt was also a sense of like, yes, this is this is what we deserve. You know, <laughs> I, I'd say the first time around, I felt a little cheated because uh, the, the first song was great. Code Yellow was amazing. And I we, we had performed it for the judges or for the producers beforehand. And we had also performed Hand Me Down Heart because we had both of the songs ready. Like, you know, when we had just met, we, we made two songs. We were ready for so when we had shown them both of them, I feel as though they're like, man, they can't win twice in a row. So we got to choose one. That's what I think yeah. happened. Because there's no other logical explanation for why they didn't choose such an amazing song like Code Yellow. But that's just my thoughts, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know you guys obviously want to win every single week. <laughs> but, you know, there are some other bands going on. And there's a lot of competition and so much talent in this season of I gotta say I I've got to give props to where the props are due and Monochromatics is a great band amazing yeah they got everything locked in the pocket the groove you know the the style the you know what I like is they they almost have like a a little bit of like a you know like a 24 karat magic Bruno Mars Mm. you know uh, Love that. I, 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 and then the old school aspect, it's almost like they're bringing back Roomba, they're bringing back the 80s. I, I love mm-hmm. that. That's, that's you know, I'm, I'm definitely appreciative of that. I got to give a shout out to Honeysuckle Rose too. Hey, that song mm-hmm. Driving, for me, that was one of my personal favorites that I would listen to every single day after they showed me it. I had a little recording of it because I got to see them perform it, you know rehearsing so, yeah so that that for me that's one of my favorite songs they've got a few other bangers that i i'm like man like like they were easily one of my favorite bands in the entire thing honeysuckle rose and then you know yeah like in the performing aspect and i i think the that's the main thing i wanted to punch here was that we were all very new to playing in front of cameras with in ears, mm-hmm. you know, I never, I barely use in ears. I own them, but I barely use them because I prefer that live raw sound. I just put some like cotton swabs in my ear and we play. I can feel the bass, you know. That's as long as I can feel it and I can hear it, I'm good. But when I put those in ears, it, it was like some like a whole new world. Obviously, you know, like you know, people prefer it or don't prefer it. You know that that's. But that that was quite um, something that I had to learn, you know, some learning curves and then, you know, playing to the cameras and having to do it again and making yourself feel comfortable around that. That's, you know, that was that's a lot of what we don't talk about, you know, behind the scenes. So much respect Mm -hmm. for all of these bands being able to create so fast and then having to perform right afterwards. That was that's the doozy you know (laughs) yeah yeah because you have you're with all these people then you're creating and writing and practicing performing right and it's just like it's all happening so fast fast. (laughs) yeah so honeysuckle rose by far like they they went through the most they they went from the beginning to the end they had to find their bearings but something about the rawness of their their sound like really Mm -hmm. really stuck with me especially with their love song driving so i gotta give them props i i I wish i could convince the producers to let them record that song because that song is by far going on my ipod (laughs) yeah yeah and i think it's cool because like you're over here just showing love to all the other musicians on the show and you're like hey i love these people and these people and this music and there's just so much good music that's coming out of this show i think that's the most interesting part about the entire thing is there's not a single band that's made a bad song yet you know like for me it seems like everybody understood the assignment and they understood their I don't want to say they stayed in their lane as if it's like, you know, get out of my way. But we all have our own lanes. We all have our own direction of where we had the idea of going. You know, Starlin had this pop slash punk, you know, kind of uh, Paramore vibe. 
Monochromatics mm-hmm. had that 80s sort of hip hop vibe with mixed with modern sounds. And they, in my opinion, had the most uh, maybe pop radio friendly sound, whereas we mm-hmm. come from more of a MGK radio friendly sound, whereas uh, Honeysuckle Rose had this like very sweet country you know sound like two two singers you know singing together duetting and and then these hooks and these riffs that just catch your ear and and it almost feels like nostalgia i never imagined myself liking gamblers in the neons country music and and they started making magic i've never you know i Mm -hmm. never experienced country music like when i saw gamblers in the neon you know, it's it's definitely not my background, but I do have appreciation for that. And when I saw them, it just blew me away. I wasn't expecting yeah. it, that's for sure. And then we got Silence the Static, which, of course, you know, my boys are in that one. Shout out to Andrew Parrott, my guitarist for Audio Crisis, who absolutely killed his solo in the third episode. Holy crap, we were staring and we were like, that man looks like a pop star and he's not even trying. You know, mm-hmm. shout out to Pablo, Pablo Falcon. That guy is insane on the bass. He's so good and he's so wild. He has so much fun on stage and all of them. They look like they look like they're all just a bunch of freaking boys, you know, playing guitar and playing the drums and just melding together and making this, you know, masterpiece. I, I, I got to say, my friend was quite impressed with Mike's voice. He was like, oh, man, that guy can sing. I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys are all so talented. That's why you're on this show. That's why you're a part of these bands. And to hear more about what you enjoy about some of the other bandmates, it's really cool to hear that you're just like, yeah, I didn't really like country, but they made me like country. (laughs) And this is what you like about them and so on and so forth. Yeah. From that moment on, I'm like, hey, I I don't even like a genre anymore. I just like music. Music is what yeah. I like. If it's good, it's good. It doesn't matter whether it's country, blues, jazz. If it's good, it'll prosper, you know? Definitely. And I love that because music is one of those things like, yeah, you can like specific genres, but then there's other music that doesn't fit into genres. And you're just like, oh, but I really like that. That speaks to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's the magic. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about the role of music in your personal life and how it has shaped you as an individual? Absolutely. I mean, I'll be completely honest. I um, was always playing music. You know, it was always in my Mm -hmm. life since I was a kid. My parents wouldn't let me get any Christmas presents until we uh, sang the, we called it the Biancicos, which is a very famous Peruvian band, uh, Peruvian group where they would invite children and they would have them sing. And it was like these, you know, classic pieces for uh, Christmas songs that we were forced to learn and we were forced to sing in order to get Christmas presents. (laughs) And that was always fun. (laughs) And then I I gotta give uh, props to my one music teacher who I, I had, luckily I went to a school, an elementary school where we had uh, this one teacher named Mr. Swenson who would just take he had such passion for music and he would mm-hmm. take all these kids, you know, they would, there was like 50 or 60 kids. They, he would pile, line them up with trash cans, giant trash cans. And he would just have them, he would just have them banging on them and show them how to do these rhythms. And then he would have like an ensemble of kids on trash cans and we would just perform for our parents. And, you know, we had the recorders, we had choirs and, that was all his, mm-hmm. you know, his doing. I think he really uh, sparked something in me to just start thinking that way. And ever since, it's just been music for me. I've, I've, I've tried other things, believe me. I've tried uh, like college. I've tried um, theater. I've tried plenty of other things. And it always seems to revolve back to that. And I'm always here like, oh, how did I end up with this instrument in my hand? <laughs> I don't remember getting here, but I'm here now. <laughs> So yeah, that's... yeah, but yeah. shout out to music teachers though, right. because music teachers really help shape children into adults who just love and breathe and appreciate music. I gotta say, I I did try to go and find Mr. Swenson again uh, over at the old school I went to, just to you know 
let him know how much he's impacted my life, but I, I, I couldn't seem to find him. And um, in all honesty, if there was ever a way for me to tell him that, it would mean a lot to me. So, you know, if hopefully if Mr. Swenson's watching, you know, you know that you've uh, created something amazing in my life. So thank you. Yes, I feel like he is going to be watching this. So hopefully if he sees this, he can reach out to you, Sergio. <laughs> Yeah, amazing. So, yes. Thank you for hanging out with us on Banded, the Encore. This was so much fun, Sergio. Thank you guys for hanging out with us and have a wonderful evening. Yeah, thank you so much. We're back on Banded, the Encore. Appreciate you rocking out with us. I'm your host, Ashley Live. My next guest is the incredibly talented Jacqueline Kenyon, lead singer from Starland. Jacqueline Kenyon, a 25-year-old singer-songwriter from Ontario, made an entrance into the music industry, joining the prestigious showcase Honey Jam at the age of 12. She has worked with Sony ATV and written music for the Eagles and Three Days Grace, as well as secured a development deal in Los Angeles. Welcome, Jacqueline. How are you today? I'm so good. How are you, Ashley? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for rocking out with us. Thank you for having me. It's, it's fun. I know, I know. So you mentioned you grew up on music like Journey and Paramore. Talk to me about their influence in your life. For sure. So I grew up in a very musical household. My dad was a piano player, singer, and was always playing Journey in our house since I was a little girl. So I had a lot of influences of rock at such a young age. And I grew up on Journey, Paramore, um, as well as Shania Twain, Michael Jackson. I think mm -hmm. I really just had such a diverse range in music at such a young age because I was just like a sponge. I just loved music. I loved mm -hmm. characters and, um, you know, people like Michael Jackson, Shania Twain, they were doing something so different at that time in music and I just gravitated towards it. Definitely. And what about Paramore in your life? Paramore, I mean, I feel like I've always just had this rock edge to my voice. And mm -hmm. Haley Williams has been one of my favorite performers, singers, and she's just so cool. I love her, and I I just kind of gravitated towards her style. Um, always when I was playing in bands when I was younger, we would just do a Haley Williams song right away. It was just kind of <laughs> natural to go to her sound and style, so I love her so much. Yeah, she's incredible. She is such she is. an electrifying stage presence, and just she is like a badass rocker. <laughs> yeah, seriously, though. She's amazing. She really is. How do you balance your artistic vision with the expectations and demands of the music industry? I love that question. Um, I look at the music industry as kind of like art. Like I look at it as a blank canvas. Everyone is going to paint a different picture, but you have to have similar tools to be able to paint that picture, whether it's the paintbrush or the canvas or the you know paint color that you use. Um, mm -hmm. it's kind of the same in music. You have different tools to be able to make a song and tell your story, but everybody's looks different at the end of the day. And I mean, I try to just stay genuine to who I am, my sound and style. And some people like it, some people don't. And that's okay. All our pictures look different in music and what we create. And, um, I think just being real is the most important thing to do because there's a lot of outside opinions on what that looks like and, and how it should be. Um, mm -hmm. And I definitely agree there is a format for sure, but it's about finding your own way to make 
that format and to create your own art. And it's really special when it comes together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's like being genuine and true to yourself because there's Yeah. so much outside force that's like, oh, you have to do this or look this way or sing this way or Yeah. act this way. Right. It's insane. So much of that. And I, I get it in a way because, of course, there's some things that just work for radio or just work with writing and, and structure. But it really starts getting in your head if you stray away from who you are and you get lost. And I've been there. It's, it's a hard spot to, to be. And it's not fun. You got to you got to just stick to who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think people will know and they'll gravitate towards you when you're true to yourself. Because if you're just doing trends and if you're like, oh, I want to do this for radio, but it's not authentically you, people can sense that. Yeah, I think so too. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the importance of connecting with your audience and how you strive to create that emotional connection through your music? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your fans are everything. These are the people that are buying tickets to your shows and listening to your music on the radio. You have to put them first. Like, I, I do know that it's a business at the end of the day, but your fans are absolutely everything. So I really strive to just make that connection as personal as I can. Um, even with what I say in my music, I want to make sure that I can relate to people. And it's just, it's very important to me to just maintain that personal connection and to be able to connect with an audience on that level, because um, that's what music is about. And if you can sing something that, you know, people are going through that maybe necessarily they couldn't say, that's a really beautiful thing at the end of the day. Mm hmm. Definitely. And I feel like there's so many songs that we've heard over the years that we know and love. And we're like, I felt that in my soul. Yes. Right. <laughs> What's That's a song the goal. that did that for you? Man, felt it in my soul. Um, I would say there's a couple that come to mind for sure. Um, Hello by Adele, of course, Mm hmm. just because that was so tailored to fit her voice and it's so beautiful. Um, I would also say, though, like, Don't Stop Believing by Journey, because when I was a little girl, that song just lit a spark in me and I got so excited and you know now the lyrics ring truer to me than they ever have in my life but it it just was something that gravitated me to love journey was listening to a song with a good message and I think even when you don't necessarily understand exactly what a song means you can feel Mm it and when I was a little girl I felt that and it's so powerful when that happens and um Yeah, those are just, they're really special songs to me. They're, they're written from such beautiful experiences in people's lives, and you can feel that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love how you Yeah. heard Journey's song. You didn't quite know what it was, what it meant because you No. were young. But yeah, I totally agree. Like, even if you didn't speak English as your first language and you heard Journey's Don't Stop Believing, you would be like, I don't know what this is about, but I feel, I feel it in me. <laughs> You could feel it. Yeah, you could feel Yeah. it. And that's what's so cool about music. You can come from all these different backgrounds. But when you hear a song and it resonates with you, it's like everyone in that audience is speaking the same language. It's so cool and so powerful. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. And Don't Stop Believing is one of those songs where I feel like so many people identify with it because you can come back to it at any point in your life. Yeah. Like, yep, that's my song. They said that. It's true. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. In your opinion, what are the most standout moments or lyrics of Hand Me Down Heart that resonate with you? So this song is so special. Um, I'd love to just tell like a really quick story of it. So when we wrote this song originally, um, we were waiting for our mentor, Wendy uh, Starlin, to come in that day to write with us. She's amazing. She developed and founded Lady Gaga. amazing person and we were in the room it was just the band we we're kind of having just a tired day everyone was just waking up getting ready for wendy to get there and my guitar player starts playing these really beautiful chords and Mm -hmm. i started humming this melody over them and we were like oh wait this is cool we have to work on a love song later with her like let's show her how you know we we wrote this and um it was so crazy because my bass player just starts singing about hearts and he's like, let me hand you my heart. And he's like, you know, like you got me used, you got me broken. And he starts just 
ranting out this beautiful lyric um, for the chorus. And he said, let me hand you my heart. And Mm -hmm. when I sang it, I sang hand me down heart just Mm. just came out. I don't know why it came out. And we all just looked at each other and we were like, whoa. And so that chorus was, you got me used, you got me broken, you got me worn out from the start. You said you'd fix my broken parts, so here's my hand-me-down heart. And we only had the first verse and chorus. Wendy came in, we showed her, and she started crying. And then we started crying, and we were tearing up. And she's like, guys, this is the song. We're working on this today. And it was so beautiful. And um, when we finished writing that song, she had a couple people from the show involved come in and listen to it. And they started crying. And it was just a cry fest. And I hope someone has it on film because it was the most beautiful thing um, ever. And it was definitely the most special day filming Banded um, that I've had in most memorable moments. So it was an amazing, amazing song. And we're so blessed and thankful that people got to see that song and that it won Song of the Night. Yeah. And thank you for telling yeah. us the backstory about it, because, right, we only see you guys do a little bit yeah. of a writing session with Wendy and then it cuts to you guys being on stage. So bringing yeah. a little bit more color to that and just being like, yeah, I kind of flubbed the lyrics up and then it just hit me. And then for Wendy to cry when she heard that. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. everyone else saying like, hey, this has got to be song of the night. And then you guys end up winning. It was so beautiful. Yeah, it was the most perfect song. And I wish they did show more of the filming behind the scenes, just like with Mm -hmm. our band and with Wendy coming in, because there's just so many cool, special moments um, that we captured during the show. Yeah. Yeah, but you know how editing is. It's one of those things where it's like we can only put so much time into... three minutes. (laughs) Exactly, with commercials and all that other stuff. So that's why we have this podcast so we can talk freely about some of the the behind-the-scenes stuff that didn't make it to the episode. Absolutely. No, this is awesome. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for hanging with us on Banded the Encore. Jacqueline, that's all the time that we have for the evening, but... We loved hanging out with you, and thank you for sharing your journey with us. We're so excited to hear all the fun music that Starlin has ready for us. Thank you. We're so excited. It was so nice talking to you, Ashley. Thank you. You too. Have a great one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. the best way to travel in a safe, environmentally sensitive, state-of-the-art jet aircraft. Ferrojet is changing the way people in the know travel. It gets you where you want to be based on your schedule, not the airlines. No hassle. Fly in perfect comfort, convenience, and safety. Next time you need to fly, fly private. Check out Ferrojet. It's more affordable than you may think. Everybody is talking about Ferrojet. Welcome back to Band at the Encore. My next guest is Robert Mendoka, guitarist for Starland. Originating from South Florida, Robert discovered his love for music at the age of 10, influenced by rock legends like ACDC and Linkin Park. Since then, he has been on a continuous musical journey, never ceasing to create. Leading the alternative rock band Audio Crisis, he established a fierce presence in the South Florida music scene and is now making waves on a global scale. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Rob. How are you? I'm doing awesome. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. In addition to Starlin, you're also in a band called Audio Crisis. How has being a part of a band influenced your growth as a musician? Oh, being being a part of a band is so cool. I love how you have so many different thoughts going around that like a lot of times you would just never think of even like no matter how good of a musician you are, you know, like a a great example is like Joey from from my band Audio Crisis, which is also in Honeysuckle Rose. You know, he's an Mm -hmm. amazing drummer and I have like a, you know, somewhat of an understanding of grooves and drums as well, but I'll show him a song. And he'll put a brand new drum beat on there that I would have never thought of, but it was 100% what the song needed. 
And um, I just like I love that that collaboration, that aspect, like just kind of expanding to the next level. Like, you know, it'll, you could have a song and it'll be here and then you have all the other minds and all the other ideas. And all of a sudden, like it's just through the roof, you know. So definitely I, I love it. I, I love playing with other people. Mm -hmm. I think collaboration is so important to the creative aspect of a song because, right, you look at the song one way and then you give it to someone else and they're like, hey, let's do this little thing right here. Mm -hmm. It definitely, it definitely makes something new, you know. Mm -hmm. What are some of the unique advantages and challenges that come with collaborating within a group as well as Starland and Audio Crisis? Um, some of the challenges is, you know, sometimes, sometimes people will have ideas that I really, really don't believe in. Like not, I it just, I, I have, I'm, I can be so set on something and I just know that this is the way that it's going to sound good. And then like mm -hmm. the other half of the band is like, nope, nope. It's this sometimes it's, it's very challenging on when some people have an idea that you just really don't think works. So like sometimes and like and it'll it'll suck when half of the band totally believes in that idea and the other half doesn't. It's just like a war. It's it's, it's like, it, it, you know, I don't know. Um, there was definitely a lot of moments like that writing with Starland where you know one half of the band thought something else and the other half thought this and but at the end of the day we always came out with a really really cool song and. You know, some some of the different writing techniques are, are definitely new to me and I kind of learned from it, you know, things that I wouldn't have thought of before. But I think that's like the important aspect of having a band because, you know, like I said before, you can be so focused, like writing songs your own way and all of a sudden, like, you know, you can learn you can learn something completely new and like have like a new door open within your mind and, or a new writing technique, which is, is pretty interesting. Yeah, and that's the cool thing about collaborating with two different types of bands. Mm -hmm. Can you share some insights into the creative process for Hand Me Down Heart? Yes. Okay. So, so it actually happened. Um, I was sitting in the kitchen with Molly and Jacqueline, and uh, it was like right when we were kind of getting to know each other. And I was, I was talking to Molly about some of her music interests and we seem to be polar opposites, but then we actually met at like MGK. She actually mm -hmm. really liked MGK and I actually, I, I love MGK. And she was, we were talking about how we had recently saw him in concert and how there's this one song that seeing him play live actually made us like the song so much more. It's just called uh, Lonely. And I never learned how to play it on guitar, but she's like, oh, you should learn it. So I started playing that that beginning riff from Lonely, and I thought it was cool. And I was inspired to write something similar, which is that beginning riff that you hear in Hand Me Down Heart. And I, I started just jamming on that. And then all of a sudden, Jacqueline, you know, hears what I'm playing and starts singing on top of it and, like, makes a little melody and we, like, just just right there we start making lyrics and it just like we didn't even force it to be a love song this was even it was before they even told us we had to write a love song it just came mm -hmm. naturally it came naturally and um i don't know that it just the song just came together so well it was no forcing it, just, it was so natural and um i don't know it was definitely out of all the songs we wrote throughout our whole time there it was definitely one of my favorite and one of the most fun songs to write yeah, I love that. And I think it's really cool when a song comes so naturally because sometimes you can get in a room with people and just be like, I don't know what we're writing. We're just not gelling. But for this song to come so naturally and then for you guys to win Song of the Night, that's such a huge honor. Yeah, it was awesome. I'm glad that it was that song because I feel like that song really deserves this light of day to get recorded and put out into the world. Yeah, and I think it's there's so many cool songs that – We've heard and we haven't heard, but I love that you said that this one is your favorite. Why this one over all the other ones you had? I guess just because of the way, like I said earlier, like the way that it was so natural to write, it was just like mm -hmm. every, nope. This is one of the songs that nobody had any head butting towards. Everything was just, oh, this is perfect. Oh, this idea right here, these lyrics, this is perfect. This melody, the way that it goes into this big bridge and this big ending where the, the, 
the melodies come together. I it was just seamless and everybody just knew that we had something special when we wrote it and we were so excited to show it off. Mm -hmm. And then we definitely felt that way when we saw you performing it up there because I think when a band comes together and they take all their creative juices and they put it into this song and then you perform it for us, it brings the song to a whole nother level. Yeah, it definitely does. So how do you balance your personal artistic expression with the desire to connect with and resonate with your audience? So that's the thing. I, I never really write something to try and resonate with anyone. I just always write whatever I want to write, whatever I'm feeling in the moment, things mm -hmm. based on me. And if, and if people happen to resonate it, resonate with it, that's awesome. If they don't, it's not meant for them. If they don't like it, it is what it is. But I just try to write as genuine as possible with what I'm feeling or whatever I'm in the mood for. Yeah, and I think being honest and genuine in your music comes across and people can say, oh, I definitely felt what Rob was saying in that song. Yeah, I think if you try too hard to resonate with people, it's just, I just, it comes comes off, it comes off as, as, as if you're literally trying too hard. You just need to, right from your own experiences and you know most people have gone through the same things that everyone has has gone through so i just think people will just naturally resonate with it mm -hmm. yeah because i feel like when we listen to a good song there's so many times you hear it and you're like oh my gosh someone wrote exactly how i was thinking and i didn't know that i was by my, I thought I was by myself in this, but no, somebody else wrote a song about how I'm feeling. Exactly, exactly. And that's just, uh, it kind of makes the biggest artists in the world get put into that spot, you know, when, when everyone around the world feels like that person knows what they're going through. Definitely. It's that connection that an artist feels with their audience. Are there any specific routines you do to get into the creative mindset when writing music? Um, I always, always get myself, um, I guess I won't say the brand, but I don't know if I'm allowed to, but uh, energy drinks, but not the ones with sugar, like the, mm -hmm. the new, the new, new ones like. Like, I mean, I'm just going to say it. If, you, if they need to take it out, that's fine. But, you know, energy drinks like Celsius and C4 or ghost, mm -hmm. I definitely have to have like my caffeine right before a writing session. And sometimes I'll do some breathing exercises as well right before just to really get my brain juices flowing. But mm -hmm. other than that, no. So energy drinks, how many of these are you consuming on a daily basis? Just, Is it like a couple? One. Yeah, no, just one. Just I'll one. just have one. And like these new ones are like, they're just so jam packed with caffeine that it'll just keep me going for as long as I need it to. Yeah, just the jolt that you need to put you in the right direction. Exactly. And so what is the breathing techniques that you do? Talk to us about that. There's like the Wim Hof method that you do where you just, you can inhale, like take big, big breaths. You do uh, 30 big breaths in a row and then you, mm -hmm. and then you blow out all the air in, uh, in your chest and you hold that for one minute. And then you do, you take, 10 more big breaths and then you hold all the air like you hold it in for another minute and then like you just get this insane sensation like this huge head rush from that and like you just feel like a lot of emotion coming from you and you just feel like very energized and just focused I, I don't even know how to explain it. you just got to try it search up how to do the Winhof breathing me method on YouTube and I'm sure you'll find a video but that that really really helps especially if you're feeling like anxious or nervous about something. It's just always a really good thing to have, a, a nice trick to have on your belt. Yeah, I think when you're going through something anxious or exciting or whatever it might be, you just have to learn how to breathe. And when you have these techniques to help you get through things, it just makes you a better person. Yeah, for sure. Breathing, breathing is so important. Yeah. I mean, yes, we're breathing right now, yeah. but just the no. fact that, that <laughs> like course. the deep breathing, you know yeah. what I mean? Like the deep breathing or the meditative breathing. Exactly. There's so many different types of breathing that could work for so many people. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Just just saying breathing is important is pretty vague. <laughs> but yeah, no. <laughs> 
there's definitely a lot you can do learning how like learning certain breathing techniques a lot of positive that will come from it yeah because i feel like sometimes when someone's in an anxious state of mind they tend to breathe very shallow mm -hmm. and fast and so it's like no all we need to do is take a couple deep step take a couple steps back and just say like oh hey i need to do like long deep breathing and like slow everything down exactly Thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight, Rob. Of course. Have a great weekend. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it so much. In 15 years, you drink about 15,000 cups of coffee. So Colgate created Optic White Pro Series Toothpaste with the power to remove 15 years of stains for a Pro Series smile. Colgate Optic White Pro Series. Mm -hmm. We're back on Banded, the Encore. I'm your host, Ashley Live, and my next guest is William James, guitarist for Starland. William is a guitarist and singer based in Nashville and a true lover of rock and roll. With an immense passion for music, he delves into the depths of creative expression, writing captivating songs and lyrics that resonate deeply. William is also the driving force behind the band Sleeper Signal. Well, what a stellar introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> you could probably of see course. me blushing already. <laughs> oh, are you blushing? William, how are you? I'm doing awesome. It's so good to be here and talking to you. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on, Ashley. Yes, yeah, so excited to chat with you. So are there any specific artists or bands that have had a significant influence on your musical style or approach? Oh, yeah. I mean, of course, um, you know, mostly rock and roll bands, you know, uh, anything from, you know, early 2000s, 90s and further back, you know, um, I tell people all the time, you know, the Beatles truly are my favorite band of all time. Uh, mm -hmm. because I feel like when I was young, that was like my first introduction to all these different styles of music, but kind of under the same roof, you know what I mean? So yeah, you know, but I'm heavy on everything. You know, I, I was driving around the other day, I was listening to some, you know, some Cuban like clave music and it, and it was grooving and it was Latin and I was just like feeling the vibe, you know? So yeah. it's, I guess, uh, yeah. But my main influences for, you know, what I've done with Starland and also in Sleeper Signal, uh, heavy on the rock and roll, you know, bands like mm -hmm. Queens of the Stone Age, Stone Temple Pilots, you know, Nirvana is a big one, Green Day, so stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like there's so many different types of rock music that you can look at and take and be like, I'm inspired by this and I'm inspired by this. The Beatles, but then Nirvana, but then all right. these other really cool influences that ultimately show people what your sound is. I agree. And I, you know, I think that I've always been drawn towards, you know, bands and artists that have fun with it. I, I feel as though like mm -hmm. music, especially rock and roll has such a sense of humor behind it mm -hmm. and it's playful yeah. and it's fun. I mean, it was the original, you know, outlaw thing, you know, you had Elvis on stage, you know, jailhouse rock and, and the mm -hmm. blues and, to what it has evolved to, uh, you know, these days is really something. I think that's, uh, it's fun, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And you take someone like Elvis, who everybody is influenced by, and then you see all these other musicians that are inspired by him and take his work and just put it into their own interpretation of that. Oh yeah, absolutely. So how have those specific artists shaped your artistic journey and contributed to your sound? Well, um, you know, I guess hearing it and seeing it live is like two different things. So I remember like, you know, the first time I saw the band Green Day, I remember mm -hmm. seeing Billy Joe on stage and kind of just delivering with all he had. And that really influenced me as a young kid 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, trying to figure out this whole approach to taking on the stage and writing music. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, seeing how it's done, seeing people get excited and being one of the ones in the crowd excited about it always kind of gave me the itch to be an exciting performer and to engage the audience and the crowd. Um, and then hearing music, I mean, I can't, I wake up and I put on music, I hop in my car and I listen to music. I don't really get burnt out from it. And uh, mm -hmm. the louder, more exciting it is, like the more excited I get, you know? Um, yeah. I remember specifically when I was 23 years old and I graduated college, I was still living in my parents' basement in the Northeast before I moved to Nashville. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of rediscovering Nirvana, you know, to bring them up again. And I was listening to Nevermind. And for the first time, it clicked in my head, you know, and I grew up listening to these songs since I was a kid. You know, my older sister mm -hmm. had it in the Walkman back in the, in, you know, back in the day. And, uh, but I never quite understood until I was a bit older and I was feeling these emotions of frustration and wanting to break free and get out and move to Nashville and all this stuff. So like, I was like, wow, this is really what angst feels like. Like I mm -hmm. thought I knew when I was a teenager <laughs> and yeah. So I guess being able to feel connected and understood and yeah, that's what makes me want to write the music that I write. I want people to feel heard, understood and connected to something. Cause that's the reason we all do it in the first place. Right. Definitely. Yeah. I love what you said about hearing Nirvana. Right. And then you're like, wait, but I'm going through that too, because I feel like when you get to those teenage years, right, like you're rebelling, you're doing crazy stuff. Oh, and yeah. when you find a band like Nirvana and you're like, wait, these guys get it. Like life <laughs> kind of sucks sometimes. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. So in terms of musical growth, how have your experiences with Sleeper Signal and Starlin influenced your songwriting and performance style? So that's a great question. Um, in terms of musical growth, I got to say, since I moved here to Nashville, which was about almost four and a half years ago now, mm -hmm. I was mostly excited because I saw music and songwriting uh, being performed on a level that I never had before. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that's even compared to, you know, the New York City music scene, like this is a whole different animal down here. So I started watching and listening and learning. I started doing songwriters rounds and trying new stuff out there before bringing it to the band. So with Sleeper Signal, though, uh, I, that originated as as only me. I came mm -hmm. up with the name Sleeper Signal and I recorded the EP by myself on every instrument. And I moved down here mm -hmm. with that basically in my pocket met the guys and then that was the first time i started writing with another group of people that i'd never known before and it took mm -hmm. a lot of sacrifice i think it took a lot of compromise and honestly it took a lot of growing up in the sense that for the first time i had to let go and let others mm -hmm. in and and trust them and not be such a control freak and that's when the magic happened that's when i started mm -hmm. being more comfortable working with other people so then fast forward to starland when i met Rob, Jacqueline, Molly, and Sergio, and Wendy for the very first time, I felt, I'm not going to say I wasn't nervous because I was like high key freaking out like that entire first week <laughs> yeah. um, because I had never done anything like that. And also I had auditioned like 72 hours before being in the house meeting those people. So like overnight, oh, wow. my life changed, you know, I had to quit my job and I had to go do this thing. But anyway... Um, so all those past experiences leading up to this, I felt comfortable and at ease and most of all confident going into a group songwriting session, uh, with strangers, because I knew that at least I had, you know, enough experience to be able to let go and let others do, you know what I mean? So like, if there was an mm -hmm. idea I wasn't crazy about, yeah, I'd voice it. But if it was a group decision, it was like, I'm not going to get hung up on this. This is probably for the better. So mm -hmm. I think that kind of encapsulates the whole idea of like growth as a musician. Yeah, definitely. Because you started off doing your own thing, right? And then right. moving to Nashville and you're like, okay, well, Nashville is going to open my eyes to all these different kinds of musicians and collaborations and songwriting rounds and, you know, 
Nashville is so amazing for musicians and what it's done for that community because you guys are kind of all in the same boat, but you can all learn from each other as well. Oh, absolutely. Especially, I love seeing like the older guys on Broadway, like at like Robert's yeah. Western World in particular, these guys have been playing like rockabilly and Western swing music forever. And they're in their sixties and they're all gray haired mm -hmm. and they're still just burning it down. I'm like, those are the grandmaster shredders, you know? <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And it's cool because Nashville has room for all of you guys, right? The 60 year old guys, but then like the people that literally were living with their parents and are just like, Hey, I need to like turn this thing up a notch and be with my people, my musicians in right. Nashville. I think it was one of the most beautiful moments in my life was moving down here because in addition to growing as a musician, I had to grow as a young man, you know, it was my first time mm -hmm. on my own. I didn't know a soul, you know, I, I came down here basically with my guitars some clothes i didn't even have a mattress i slept on the floor the first night waiting for my mattress oh, to get. Wow. so yeah so growing a lot personally in turn like helped me grow as a musician too uh because at the mm -hmm. end of the day it's it's you and your craft you know people come and people go and times mm -hmm. change but the one thing that is a constant is you know having that guitar in your hand and having this beautiful craft that is a lifelong experience yeah, I love that. So what made you choose Nashville to move to, right? Because you could have picked any city in the world, but what was it about Nashville that you said, that's well, my city? So a couple of different things. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I'm from, I'm from New York originally, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and so like I, I, as much as I love Manhattan and the Bronx and all that stuff, it, to me, it just didn't seem like the music was going to be happening there. It also mm -hmm. is crazy expensive and honestly like i was just burnt out i wanted a, a complete change i wanted to run away from home basically that's a lot of it too i was frustrated i was burnt out graduating mm -hmm. college i just was like i need i need some fun i need to i felt like i followed the rules up until that point and i was like it's yeah. me time and it's now or never so but a good friend of mine had moved down here uh like basically a year prior to me uh we were in school mm -hmm. together he graduated a semester earlier than I did. And he followed a girl down here to Nashville because she, she was going to med school down here. And he called me mm -hmm. up. He said, yo, Willie, what are you doing for spring break? I said, I don't know, man. I'm be playing. He's like, bro, you got to get down to Nashville, bro. Everything is a guitar, bro. You're going to love it. It's going to be so sick. Because my buddy, my buddy Shane, like he and I were kind of the odd couple friendship. He was like the jock football player. And I was like the weird jazz kid. So like, but we were, became so close and sure enough, I came down and visited and I was like, dude, I'm going to finish this semester. I'm going to wrap up this album and I'm going to be freaking down here as soon as possible. And exactly a year later I was there. So it was incredible. Wow. <laughs> yeah. wow. What a story. And I right? love that he was just like, yeah, you got to come down here. Like you're missing out. Right. Right. Somebody who doesn't even really know music like that, you know, like they, they even knew like this is the spot. So you know, I'm lucky I've got a really good support system and I have the best friends and family in the world. And I just like, you know, having these folks in my corner, I have so many people who I consider like family, even though they're just friends, like, and they're my rock and my support, you know, my beautiful girlfriend, Katie, she was so supportive through this whole TV show experience. And yeah, a lot of things were made easier uh, with her support. So it was incredible. I love that. I think it's so important that you do have a support system around you, a strong one, right? People that believe oh, yeah. in you, your family, your friends, mentors, just people that just want to push you and want the best for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so collaboration and teamwork are essential in any band. How do you navigate creative differences or challenges that come up during the songwriting process? Yeah, so I mean that that can be that can be a tricky one. That can be a touchy situation, um, mm -hmm. you know, because every feeling that happens musically or creatively means so much to the person that created it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you come to your group with something that's not necessarily agreed on, or vice versa, someone's going to be taking some sort of compromise and some sort of blow to their idea you know there have been so many times there was particularly with sleeper signal i wrote this song called angel 
this song mm-hmm. is going to be recorded after I had to fight <laughs> fight for it, basically. <laughs> um, I was playing it in my kitchen, and my little sister came in and said, hey, who wrote that song? And I stopped and started laughing. I said, I did. And she's like, yeah, okay. She's like, who wrote that song? I want to look it up on Spotify. I was like, you can't. I haven't recorded it yet. So I knew I had something good, but then I brought it to the band, and they were like, Eh. like they weren't as excited about it and I was crushed. So Mm -hmm. I think again, coming back to the whole like compromise and letting go of control and just trusting the process and those around you is Mm -hmm. what really makes it work. So dealing with kind of, you know, creative differences and and things of that nature. um, You know, when we wrote, Code Yellow, uh, which was the first song we wrote together, I think the idea happened rather quickly. I remember being mm-hmm. in the room and Rob and I just started like playing, right? And it, I, I picked up rather quickly that we have a similar style and like a lot of the same things, which ended up mm-hmm. being true. Um, I freaking love Rob, like a little brother. That kid is so amazing and talented. I can't wait to see him again. Um, and then Jacqueline started penciling out lyrics like and I was like this is so crazy so we didn't really disagree or have any sort of tension on that neither did we with hand me down heart which might be I don't know if it was my favorite song that we did but it's definitely Mm -hmm. top three favorite um that was one of the most beautiful songs I've ever written or gotten to be a part of and Mm -hmm. it happened so organically Um, And I remember that day and I remember being in the movie theater of the house we were living in, penning out this song and then Wendy coming in and freaking out and then grabbing Mark Shulman to come have a listen and Mark Shulman's crying. And I'm like, don't cry, don't cry. (laughs) Um, You know, because it was a very honest moment for the band. You know, when we were writing those lyrics, like that was something that I personally felt, you know, and the song kind of captures the feeling of, being okay with somebody loving you for everything that you are, despite any shortcomings, you know, and that's where, how we got the whole idea of the song, you know, you, you got me used, broken, worn out from the start. Here's my hand me down heart. You know, what could be more beautiful right. than that? You know? So, yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and whenever we did have like creative differences, we worked it out, mm-hmm. you know, and I think it speaks volumes to the maturity of the band as a whole. Yeah. Wow. That's so powerful. And to know when you just come up with this song that you have people crying over it. Wait, so William, did you cry when you heard this song or were you trying to hold back? Cause you're like, I'm not trying to show my emotions right now. <laughs> so I had, I had, I had a little bit of a cry, not in front of the band. Um, but mm-hmm. later that evening, I remember I was sitting on the deck of the little, like, like basically there was like a, like a dock on the lake where the house was Mm -hmm. and I was watching the sunset and I just was thinking like, wow, how special is it that, you know, I'm out here doing these things. And at the time also feeling tremendously loved by my, my girlfriend and my partner, you know, and I just was like, I was listening to the demo and I, I shed a little bit of a tear, you know, I was like, this is, I also had had like a very busy, rough summer leading up to that where I was just so mentally exhausted and physically exhausted. And I was like, wow, all that hard work that I've had to put in, in music Mm -hmm. and in my personal life and in my relationships is all working out in a beautiful way. And so, yeah, that song captures like that feeling for me. And yes, I definitely (laughs) shed a tear or two. Well, thank you for sharing that because I feel like people need to hear that, right? Because when you hear certain songs, emotion comes out. And yeah, you had gone through so much before you came on this show. And then you're like sitting there by yourself and you're like, wait, like all this amazing stuff is going on. But I went through this stuff in my past and it's just, I'm glad that you were able to have that release. It's so powerful. It really is. I think, you know, a lot of things are kind of coming full circle these days and Mm -hmm. If, you know, if I could say anything to anybody listening, you know, when the going gets really rough, it's, if it's something you truly are passionate about and believe in, stick it out Mm -hmm. because it's going to work out. And, you know, so it's cool to see it all happening. (laughs) Yes. And we're so happy to be on this journey with you. This is so fun. Of course. So how did it feel to win song of the night for Hand Me Down Heart? 
it felt incredible um, to see such a positive response from the judges to nail that guitar part too. It was, it, it sounds like a very simple song, but there's a lot of dynamic to it. You know, there was, I was mm -hmm. using a delay pedal click to a certain tempo. Like, and so the craziest thing too about this, like being on the show, it's like you wrote this song a week ago and mm -hmm. you have two chances to play it live for the first time don't screw up because you're going to be on TV. So it's like, that's in the back mm -hmm. of your head the whole time, but you're also trying to give a, and deliver this like epic performance. Right. So mm -hmm. I felt relief once it was over because I, I was hearing how amazing we sounded through my in-ear monitors and how on point I particularly was. And Jacqueline's voice was freaking so beautiful and amazing. And I just was relieved, but also super proud. And then, you know, the judges and their critique was so kind and, it felt like, yeah, like we definitely did it and we did it really well. So when they announced that we had won in the back of my head, I wasn't really surprised, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it felt amazing uh, to have success that quickly. You know, the second mm -hmm. song challenge, um, I think that boosted our confidence a lot mm -hmm. and uh, kind of set the tone going forward. Yeah, and we're so excited to see your journey on this show and hear all the incredible music that you guys have. Yeah, thank you. You're so welcome. Well, thank you for rocking with us, William. Anytime. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. This was so much fun. It certainly was, Ashley. It was a pleasure. And everyone out there, you got to riff hard, baby. <laughs> Time is what we make it. A single moment can be unforgettable. This is the power of wearing a Bulova. Make bold moves that reverberate across generations. Fairjet, the best way to travel in a safe, environmentally sensitive, state-of-the-art jet aircraft. Ferrojet is changing the way people in the know travel. It gets you where you want to be based on your schedule, not the airlines. No hassle. Fly in perfect comfort, convenience, and safety. Next time you need to fly, fly private. Check out Ferrojet. It's more affordable than you may think. Everybody is talking about Ferrojet. Welcome back to Banded the Encore. I'm your host, Ashley Live, and I'm excited to introduce my final guest, Wendy Starland, mentor for Starland. Wendy is an American singer, songwriter, and music producer from Los Angeles. She was honored by the Songwriters Hall of Fame, named VH1's Best Emerging Artist, featured on Moby's Grammy-nominated album last night, and opened for Sheryl Crow and Jack White. Wendy discovered and developed Lady Gaga during the recording of the Fame album, which received Billboard's Album of the Decade. How are you, Wendy? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me, Ashley. It's so good to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to finally have you on the podcast. And you won Song of the Night. Woohoo! So excited. So proud of my band, and I feel just so lucky. Uh, I have the best, the best team to work with on the planet, and uh, and the song really came out great, and I'm so proud of them. It's such a beautiful song. So, hand me down, heart. Talk to me when you found out that you guys won. What did you think? What did you feel? I just. I felt so incredibly excited and proud. I really feel like the song has this timeless quality to it, like a real classic heartfelt song. And, um, you know, the term hand me down heart that became the, uh, you know, lead part of the hook is Jacqueline Kenyon's idea when she, you know, came down with that and, I'd never heard it phrased quite that way, um, mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, you've got me used, you've got me broken, you've got me worn out from the start. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how so many relationships start. We can't get rid of our baggage so quickly when we're going into something new. And so um, yeah. 
I feel like it's, it's profound and touching and I'm so proud that we were able to write something that was so powerful. Yeah, I think it's such a powerful song and we all resonated with it when we heard it. We were like, oh my gosh, we've been through that too. Yeah, yeah, well, that's what we aim for. <laughs> we aim to make something, you know, music that is timeless and universal, so. And it's like, hey, this song has to win Song <laughs> of the Night. It just pulls on our heartstrings. Thank you, thank you so much. We're, we worked hard on it and are incredibly proud. So thank you for saying that. Of course, congratulations. Thanks. Given the competitive environment on the show, how do you differentiate Starlin from other bands? Well, um, first of all, we really uh, tailor made all of the songs um, around Jacqueline's voice. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Rob, Sergio, Will, Molly, we all um, group together to um, th there's no great song unless a singer can execute it 250 nights a year because it's one mm -hmm. thing to be able to perform it you know a couple times in the studio a couple times on stage but if this band is going to do what we need it to do what we want it to do uh, they're going to be touring most of the year uh, for the at least the next three years and so we really tailor made the melodies, the the harmonies, all of the instrumentation to support the vocal. And mm -hmm. um, in terms of identifying the band, uh, you'll see later in the season, um, I brought out a bunch of surprises uh, for the live stage show that are really exciting and, um, you know, give give the audience a real show instead of um just an awesome performance it's it goes beyond that and so that's uh that's coming up around the corner so i'm not going to spoil i'm not going to give a little spoiler here no spoilers yet so we have to stay <laughs> tuned to see what's coming up in the next few episodes yes it's very exciting but basically in terms of your question uh identifying the unique characteristics in uh, Jacqueline's voice and then identifying them and creating a song that really shows off those characteristics. And that's what's really important about creating band identity and a sound that is, um, you know, very personal. Mm -hmm. And I love that you use Jacqueline as, you know, the mold, if you will, like you looked at her and you're like, okay, what is her voice doing? Who is she personally? And I just want to build this band entirely around her. Well, I think with any band, you have to, you know, support what the singer's natural gifts are. And mm -hmm. so if you got a, a singer with a real, you know, raspy, growly kind of voice, then you... Um, put vowel sounds at the ends of the phrases of the lyrics that will accentuate that. If you've got uh, a singer with a great range like Jacqueline's, um, you will see throughout the season, we've got songs that have her going sky high and the band soars around it. You know, uh, Will and Rob with guitar parts that are going to just emphasize and accentuate that, you know, Molly with drums that are just going to make it, you know, her voice soar while she and Sergio on the bass are just thumping, um, mm -hmm. giving it that power and that grounding. And so it's creating an environment and a space around um, the artist that is going to allow them to soar. Yeah. And I, I love what you said about how they're all working together and just all these beautiful things the recording, the writing, and ultimately the stage performance where you guys are all competing. Absolutely. And they're such incredible natural performers. They're all complete pros, by the way. I mean, I mm -hmm. know they're super young. And so everyone's like, oh, young band, young kids. But they are total pros. They've been doing it their whole lives. And um, they deserve ultimate respect. They have all my respect. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so sweet of you to say. Well, that's awesome. It's, it's so true. I mean, I do feel like the luckiest one that I got 
I mean, all of the um, musicians on this show are incredibly talented. I was really blown away by the mm-hmm. talent on this show. It's not like some of the other music competition shows I see where it's like, oh, there's someone great and then there's a dud. Everyone yeah. is on an extremely high level. Um, but my band has the personality traits to match. So, you know, each person brings their own unique uh, trait and characteristic and talent to contribute that make it, in in my opinion, you know, stand out above everyone else and uh, make it so fun and inspiring to be around. You know, they're just, they're the best. We're we're such a family and I'm so lucky that uh, they were assigned to me. I feel like the lucky one. And we love to hear that because we see you guys put in all this hard work together. But to know that you guys actually love and appreciate each other personally and have fun with each other just makes it a whole nother level of fun. Oh, we we talk every day. And (laughs) I'm just I'm so grateful for these individuals who have come into my life and, you know, filled up my heart. I, I really, <laughs> the love song is dedicated to them. I, I absolutely, uh, um, you know, I feel very grateful to be working with them. Mm-hmm. So being a mentor on Banded involves providing guidance, but also being part of a competitive environment. Can you shed some light on how this blend of mentorship and competition influences your interactions with the rest of the cast? Well, you know, it's really, I don't know um, how much uh, you can see it, but basically it's just as much the, the songwriter producers, the mentors uh, Mm -hmm. competing against each other as the contestants, as the musicians, because basically I mean, the talent, they're responsible for whatever song is ultimately presented on that stage. They're responsible for whatever happens on that stage, for mm-hmm. how and looks, sounds. I mean, it's, you know, it's so much work. You're really mm-hmm. fighting hard. Um, and each of the mentors has their own style. Their backgrounds are mind blowing. So, Mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, writers and producers for Eric Clapton, Miley Cyrus, uh, Keith Urban, um, Toby Keith, Rascal Flatts. I mean, you name it, they have unbelievable resumes. And so when a song gets on that stage and you know that, you were responsible for that song and producing mm-hmm. that song. And uh, who's going to win? It, it's a competitive environment and not just for the musicians, for the songwriter producers as well. Yeah. Because you all want to bring your A game and you all want to win. It's it's, and it's all like, it, it really proves to me at least like a great song is a great song in any genre. So People could be like, oh, well, how can a, a song compete in di- oh, from different genres? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. A great song is a great song. So right. um, that's really what this proves. And, you know, a great song can be produced in any genre. And mm-hmm. so uh, bringing our A game, bringing the best of the craft. And don't get me wrong. Even though it's competitive, I love, I absolutely adore the other writer-producers on this show. I mean, I'm very, very good friends with them. And so I, I feel just it brings out the best in me to be able to write something that will, you know, with the band where we're coming up with our most clever ideas and uh, best stage show possible, you know you are writing your legacy every day. And so we want to come out of this feeling like we've given it our all. Yeah. I love what you said about writing your legacy, right? It's what you're leaving behind and putting your everything into this show. Absolutely. We have to, you got to give it your best. How you do something is how you do everything. So 
We want to show who we are. And I know that Starlin's got the goods. I know that this band uh, can really stand the test of time. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on being honored into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Could you tell us more about that honor and what it means to you? Well, I well, thank you, first of all, for saying that. Um, being honored by the Songwriters Hall of Fame uh, was one of the, you know, greatest <laughs> moments of my life. As someone who's been writing songs since she was seven years old, um, you only dream of being honored by the highest uh, caliber of uh, songwriters and being, you know, included uh, in that group. So I feel really blessed and happy. And it just meant to me that I was improving <laughs> and, I'd, and I'd reached some sort of uh, mark in my life that uh, – just made me feel really good about my progress and um, and keep staying inspired and and keep trying to churn out the hits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and to be honored in such a way and have them say, hey, we appreciate you, we love you, we see what you're doing and we're ready to be on this journey with you. It feels amazing. And um, especially, you know, a, a lot of times uh, the honorees are, you know, towards the end of their career. And so I feel very lucky to have um, been honored at, uh, you know, a very early age in my career. Um, and that I still, you know, it gave me the impetus to keep striving, keep working hard and, you um, ways to get inspired. So I feel like I'm able to, I, it gave me a lot of versatility because I just kept doing it. So now I've got, um, probably around in the vicinity of about 2000 recorded songs. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a bit. And, um, I have, I have a, a they're in all different genres. Um, mm -hmm. Saying before, a great song is a great song in any genre, and I've been able to work with so many different types of artists that it's given me experience in um, a multitude of genres. But uh, luckily, Starland is in a genre that um, is really kind of my favorite. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really happy uh, with what we're doing and felt inspired throughout the course of the entire show. So. Yeah, and we look forward to hearing all these other songs that you guys have coming up. Yeah, they they are awesome. And I, again, just can't say enough about how incredible this band is and mm -hmm. that they're going to have a long career in the music business. And we're so excited to go on this journey with you guys. Thank you. So excited to be here. And I love... Bandit is really spectacular because it's creating, it's unlike the other competition shows where they're basically professional karaoke, where there are some mm -hmm. great singers singing some great songs that were already written and already hits. It's not hard to, it's one thing to perform a song. It's another thing to create something from scratch, an original statement where the band is really, um, identifiable and um, has its own thing going on. So I'm very um, happy to be part of an original music uh, show that's creating original content and original music. Definitely. I feel most people resonate more with original content than they do with billboard hits, right? Because it comes from the heart. Well, they get to be a part of the process. So right. Everybody loves that behind the scenes things because they love to be able to see the band's growth and development. And mm -hmm. um, so you will see that throughout this season. I assure you the growth and development is out of this world. Yeah, because you go from doing the first song and then you learn from the first song what to do in the second song and so on and so forth. And we have quite a few more episodes to learn more about you and your incredible band.
Yeah, well, also the fact that there's an assignment. So, you know, when you're writing music, you're usually just writing from the heart, but now it's really got to be within the structure and confines of the assignment. So um, what are the differentiating qualities between um, the different types of songs? You have to be really specific when you're writing and have that mindset. So it, you know, takes a lot of focus. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Wendy, thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight on Banded the Encore. I'd like to thank Steve Diamond, Molly Rose, Sergio Canada, Jacqueline Kenyon, Robert Mendoka, William James, and Wendy Starland. Guys, tune into Banded every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on Access TV. What did you guys think of tonight's episode? Let us know in the comments below. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and rock on.